to the Church of Mavis radio show. It's Friday night, coming at you live from Florida. Man, I went down to the beach and got cooked. Like, I even, I've even i been putting stuff on now, but it'll get you. Because there's, like, cool air flying through, and you're like, oh, it's cool, it's okay. No, you're not. It gets you anyway. I've been burned and fricasseed, and it was pretty, though. So at least there's uh, – I was there with Christina, so at least it was very – beautiful sunsets and uh the pier was nice we need to go to pier park i know that's where truman show was uh filmed at i, I know i've been there for so it's been forever but uh you're listening to united public radio tonight's guest uh stephen edrit flowers how's it going stephen great to have you here oh it's going fine here We're, we have quite a bit of rain going on it's more suitable for the valpurgis uh atmosphere than i suppose sunny florida yes it's it's the amazon here and i'd rather it be cold as it's been i'm up in the pan, I, i'm up in the panhandle so at least it gets a little colder than oh, down yeah. south but it's like the amazon it, you can feel it already crushing in yeah. the bugs are trying to carry you off and everything but it's great Alligator to have you people here coming in yeah. yeah, we just had Don on, and that was a great show about his vampire magic book. Had a lot of fun. Right. I've been looking, looking forward to this. Your book's Revival of the Runes, the Modern Rediscovery and Reinvention of the Germanic Runes. Now, I know a little bit about runes, but you and Wham probably definitely have me beat. But I guess I, my, my first question that I'm wondering about is – when it comes to the origin of the runes, is the Odin story the only kind of story of that, or are there a bunch of different stories? Like where they <laughs> no, came, that's, that's they came the from. only myth that uh, accounts for the origin uh, of the runes. Of course, uh, and within the realm of Germanic literature, it's only uh, Icelandic literature that uh, preserves the uh, heart, soul. Uh, of any kind of pagan past. Uh, the other literatures just give sh- shadows, and and we, we would know very little about the mythology of the ancient Germanic peoples if we didn't have the sort of uh, fly in the amber or be in the amber there in the, in, in the literature of, of Iceland. And that's in the Edda where we find this explicitly but then that is used to explain other things that are very uh sort of uh dark references that can only be sort of explained that in terms of Odin or Wodan being the uh originator of, of runes or being the father of runes and uh this Johannes Burius, Burius. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, Johannes Burius. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Johann, that... he, his friends called him Johann Bure, but he, but Johannes Bureus, when he was in, uh, that's how they Latinized their name so that when they wrote in Latin, they could fit their names into the grammar of the language. That's what they were doing there. So. That's how they get that. <laughs> but Johan Bure is good enough. But, uh, yeah, he, uh, he's quite a, a, a guy. He, it turns out that he is a sort of a role model before I even knew I had one, uh, for what I uh, ended up uh, doing in my life because he was the, uh, a Rosicrucian, a mystic, a magician, all those things. But he also was one of the first along with another guy with an even weirder name, Ole Vorm, uh, in Denmark. He, uh, both of these guys started to figure out really how to read these runic inscriptions that were all over their countries, but nobody knew how to read them anymore. You know, except farmers or people in very uh, remote areas of Sweden, on the island of Gotland, and in, the, in a... Uh, district north of Stockholm, there were farmers who still knew how to read and write these runes, and that's who this guy went to to find out what there are these things about, and then he figured out how to decode these thousands of runic inscriptions that littered his homeland. There are 5,000 of such stones in, in uh, Sweden alone. 
So I know today I have a set that's like made out of lapis lazuli, and you have your the basic set that we know today. So there's so apparently they've been cut back and kind of like like uh, cut out, or I mean, there's many. You said five thousand. So what what brought it down to the basic set that we know today? Well, there are five thousand rune stones. That is inscriptions, all, almost all of which are memorial stones to dead. Uh, ancestors and so forth, and typically translating to something like um, Guthrun had this stone set up uh, after, meaning in memory of her father. He was a good man. Uh, Opier carved the runes, something like that. It's what these things typically read, and you see that these things are not gravestones. They are memorial stones that are set up generally either uh, outside of grave mound sets, uh, family graveyards, if you will, uh, but on a road outside them or near them, or just on public roads where people pass by because the point of the stone was, well, to memorialize, but only 1% of the people at the time the stones were carved, only, uh, it's estimated, only about 1% of the population could read them. This was, these people were really not literate in our sense uh, of trying to use writing for ordinary purposes, but rather they used it for this kind of uh, special mythic kind of religious purpose. And... The stone, reading the stone itself, we know from the evidence on many of the stones themselves, was a magical act. If you've ever seen these rune stones or pictures of them, uh, the, the, they have typically have serpents, serpentine design on them. And then the runes are carved in the ribbon that the serpent or animal uh, zoomorphic body uh, uh, displays. And so the person reading it has to find out where does this thing start and kind of crane their neck around. And it's a, really a decoding exercise more than just reading it like we would a book or a piece of paper or whatever. And it would take some time to read it. And at the end of some of them, it gives the a reason why all of this is happening that way. And it says, for example, uh, good luck in the pagan times, good luck, hey, in Old Norse or Old Swedish, hey, so er rist, hey, so er reid. Good luck to him who carved them. Good luck to him who is reading them. So it was a boon, a, a magical charge, but see, it went two ways. It went back to probably a dead man who had carved them in the past. That verb was in the past tense. Uh, good luck to him who carved them. Good luck to him who is now reading them, to you, the reader. And that would be an actual magical uh Blessing, if you will. And then later in Christian times, this didn't stop with Christianity coming. They still carved these stones. And so they would say, uh, God bless him who carved them. God bless him who's reading them. They just changed the form of the blessing, but the, but the really pagan, indigenous, autochthonous uh, rationale for the stones uh, remains. And that is a magical power being conveyed to the other world and back to you. And when it comes to so there's to, more to them. Uh, okay. Yeah. When it comes yeah, to more to them than When it comes to revivals, and I know you talked about Christianity, did they try to kind of like wipe them off the earth and then they'd come back? Did they always try to suppress it? Not, not in the beginning. Not in the beginning. The, with uh, the Catholic people. Uh, in the Catholic age, of course, Scandinavia, it's very curious as far as religious history is concerned. The last regions of Europe to be converted to Christianity were the first ones to throw it off. 
the uh, Sweden, for example, where we've been talking about mainly, uh, wasn't converted to Christianity until 1100. Mm. Okay, and by 1500, they uh, they went Protestant as soon as they could, which uh, in uh, in Protestantism, one of the main political aspects of it was that the king, the the monarch of the land becomes the chief religious uh, figure. In England today, the queen is called the defender of the faith. She's really the highest religious authority in the country as well as secular. And that is typical of um, Protestant countries. But that's also typical of pagan past, whereas the Catholic medieval order of the universe was supposed to be, you have the pope, who's the sacred head, who's the boss, yes, but then we have a king who is a secular uh, enforcer of the, of the religious law and authority, but uh, they're different and separate. So uh, with Protestantism and in Sweden and so forth, uh, they went back as soon as they could to a national church, the Swedish church, the English church, the the uh, Danish church, etc. They were national churches as they remain today. But uh, so it, that is interesting that uh, the last ones converted to Christianity were the first ones to rebel against it. And again, in Germany, southern Germany, <clears throat> which had been part of the Roman Empire, remained Catholic, whereas the northern part that was never conquered by the Romans became Protestant. So if you look at a, a, a map, of a religious map of Germany, you'll see it almost exactly matches up with where the empire was versus was not. That's the authority of the prestige of Rome and things Roman. So to those people who were part of the empire uh, historically. So for some reason, I think of Vikings who may have, you know, went to Britain and became Christian, but they were still probably doing the runes in the shadows, so to speak. Yeah, well, they were pagans when they they, when they first invaded uh, uh, England, of course, in 797 when the Viking Age starts, and they start to to make incursions into England mainly, and also around all of the other uh, British and. Uh, Isles and Ireland and everywhere. You know, there were no towns at all in Ireland when the Vikings came. They established all the towns you see on the map now, the cities, were all originally Viking trading posts. But uh, they uh, invaded these areas and colonized them. Began. That's what Led Zeppelin's immigrant song is about that. It's about the, the Vikings coming to England. The West, it says, we will not cease till we reach the western shore. You can't hardly understand Robert Plant as he sings it, but, you know, when uh, you hear it, uh, somebody else sing it, uh, it's uh, clearer. But uh, they, they, they were pagan, so they re-paganized the whole northern part of England uh, after these invasions started, there was a thing called the Dane Law in northern England, and the Saxon kings had to pay the Danes. That was the only way they could defend themselves against them at certain times, uh, was just to pay them what, if we don't pay them, they'll come and take it, you know, and they'll take the rest of the land also. And then uh, kings like Alfred the Great and others started to push them back. My namesake, Edred, my grandfather's name was Edred, and I was named after him. He was dead by the time I uh, was born, and that's part of Germanic. Uh, my parents didn't know it, but you know, they were practicing good Germanic reincarnation theory, uh, naming the children the, after dead ancestors, Re, uh, and thus causing them to be reborn into the family. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the they uh, Edred was uh, one of the guys that uh, was a real warrior king who uh, was responsible for defeating Eric Bloodaxe in uh, York. You know, but uh, that is all 
they were pagans and then they slowly converted to Christianity, but it was a very slow process there in England. And really, they certainly... started to hit them in the hit them in the rear end, you know, by Christianizing uh, Denmark and Norway and so forth, because the people who were adventurers they you know, weren't too keen on the idea of Christianity. That's how uh, Iceland really started to be settled out there in this, you know, forsaken <laughs> icy world, because they left Norway, most of them to get away from uh, Christianization and, and and so forth. And I know it says Johannes that I guess he started to combine the runes with folklore and Renaissance high magic. Is that where they kind of like link them to gods from Norse mythology or is that what is no, it mean by No, no, that's uh, the – he uh, sort of, like you said, uh, correct there, the uh, high magic and the sort of he, – he was a Renaissance man – totally educated in the Latinate world and all of that, but the folklore regarding runes uh, continued on among those people who could still use them, those few that I mentioned before. But uh, if we see in Iceland, uh, that's where these people were remembering all of these poems that we, where these things are re- reported about Odin and his f- finding of the runes and the whole thing, I know that I hung on a windy tree, all of that. They memorized these poems, so Icelanders actually memorized them. That's what, and then wrote them down when they learned to write in Latin letters. But uh, the figure Snorri Sturluson, the guy who wrote the Edda, which is this book of, kind of a textbook of how to write poetry, skaldic poetry in Icelandic, for Icelanders, wrote it in 1222. It's full of, that's where we get a very systematic view of pagan uh, Germanic religion. And he codified this and wrote it down in order, really, his uh, ostensible purpose was to keep the pagan lore alive because you can't, in his estimation, uh, write good poetry about anything else but that. So uh, that's why he wrote this book, to keep this alive. And he wrote the biography of Egil Skatla Grimson, who's uh, a runic, he's a true a guy who lived in the 900s. He was a... Uh, warrior uh, and uh, rune magician and his saga eagle saga uh, tells where it gives you a personality really for what a rune magician in the viking age would have been like and how he thought how he uh, his religion how he related to the gods and and other people and so forth and, and snorri Sturluson probably wrote that saga as well well, what are some so, ways that you that you would consider like using them for magic? Because I know they engrave them on things and stuff like that. But let's say someone who me definitely would be a novice. But what are some some ways that they use them that are for magic? Well, uh, you could uh, because the people uh, uh, we are at a great disadvantage uh, uh, when the word I would use technically is operatively. Uh, magic is as operation, how to do things with symbols how to to communicate with the causal world. Let's go back to Egil Scott Lagrimson. He, as in one episode, he is uh, uh, in a hall, typical thing like you see in these Viking movies and so forth, and uh, somebody brings him a horn. That's something to drink out of uh, with ale in it. And uh, he figures, hmm, somebody might put, have put poison in there. So he carves some runes on it. Uh, he stabs uh, his uh, hand with, uh, uh, with that knife that he carved with and rubs blood on it, says a magic spell over it, and the horn bursts asunder, breaks, explodes. Uh, there's poison in there, you see. So that's a perfect example from within that world where we see that these communications make 
things happen. Mm -hmm. Because, why? Because in one ancient runestone, we get the, the clue, the key. And that is it's a, the stone of Nolabi from 600. It says, uh, the, uh, the, uh, these runes are here, and it says they are derived or descended from the gods. You see, this is the language, the meta-language of the gods who can make things happen. But the rune magician, someone who is initiated into this knowledge base uh, and using Odin as role model, and God, like Hegel Scott Lagrimson did uh, over a thousand years ago, s starts to be able to do the same kind of meta communication with the universe using runes. Now, our disadvantage tends to be, as modern current people, is that most people approach the runes as isolated symbols, don't they? I mean, most people, you see books on runes, even my own, Futhark, whatever. It tends to say, this rune means these things. That's true. All that's true. But the way they were used and really put into operation was that people wrote not long-winded stuff, but pithy, formulaic communications written in these runes which were designed to cause things to happen how to do things with words but the runes because they are derived from the gods as this stone tells us and Edda talks about it too and we see how Odin discovered them he didn't invent them he discovered them which are the word rune means mystery or secret they are mysteries of the universe, codified into a system originally of 24 signs arranged in three rows. It's kind of like a periodic table of meaning. And so we can recombine them. And we, English speakers today, uh, we can still write in runes. In fact, the runic system, uh, most uh, proper to our own language is the Anglo-Saxon English runic system. And you could write runes very well. I see most people who t attempt to write runes and do write in them sometimes almost exclusively use the older Futhark of 24 runes. And, of course, people like me who started to write on the runes in 1984 publishing uh, Ralph Blum doesn't count because he didn't know that there was even a runic you know, system at all uh, it was just kind of arbitrary order and it wasn't really a runic system but you know that that had such an impact people just say yeah that's those are the runes and they try to write it but really if you wrote English in Anglo-Saxon runes you have all of the variations of pronunciation that we use. Our language is very archaic in its sound. We make sounds that are very archaic. German has lost most of them. Uh, the Scandinavian languages, except uh, Icelandic, have lost most of them. The th and the th and the w sound, so those things. Those had runes. And we, that's kind of interesting, you see. We say W for the W sound. That means there was no Latin letter for that anymore in the Middle Ages. Uh, so they had to double the U to make that W sound out of a U, W. Or the thorn and the Z the, the sound. With no, no, no Latin letter for that, so they had to do TH. Two letters had to be employed, or the um sound. There's a room for that, but not a Latin letter for it. And so they had to do ng to account for those sounds that weren't there. So uh, runes are, are made for expressing the language we're speaking right now much better than the Latin alphabet is, which is kind of a makeshift uh, attempt to uh, to represent the sounds of our language. So runes are really indigenous to us. And uh, a lot of 
pilgrims, people, Christians, but, you know, uh, how, how the identity they had, these Anglo-Saxon pilgrims going to Rome. There's a lot of graffiti there from the Middle Ages where people put their names on walls or wherever uh, in runes. And the reason they did it in runes is that I am English. I am Anglo-Saxon, see. And so that was not only their name as being this is my identity, but also the way in which I write my name tells you of a community to which I belong. And that's has, has that was intended as a magical act because they're trying to impress themselves, their being on this location, which is a place of pilgrimage and for saints, whoever, you know, there in Rome. But so that's there, there's a magical intent in that form of communication. It's not just graffiti defacing property. It's an attempt to identify oneself and oneself with one's environment. So it's a theory of communication that's being actualized there. I know it was fascinating in your book how you mentioned some references to uh, the runes, the three central runes uh, to the Truin and Thor, Odin, Frey, and how you kind of paralleled some of the Christian belief system with some like Thor being linked to Jehovah and things like that. That was definitely very fascinating. And what are some of the, I know it's complex, and but what are some of those connections? I mean, it seems like there are some strange connections like that that are kind well, of very uh, similar. Uh, uh, the uh, Germanic peoples, or the Celtic peoples, or any peoples, uh, the, the Afro-Caribbean peoples, uh, etc. They well, they have their uh, Voodoo, they have their Mokumba, they have their Santeria, and all of these things, right? Yes. Wherein the Christian saints and deities and whatever they have uh, are identified with pagan indigenous. Uh, spiritual entities so that this apparent, apparent saint is actually masking a, a pagan god. And that happens universally when a foreign, just out of nowhere religion is imposed on a people. They don't just, because there were no originally uh, any Sunday schools? No, people were not indoctrinated into Christianity. Only the priests were. The people were expected to be obedient, come to church, take the sacrament, not say things that were wrong, etc. Kind of like, you know, you were a Bolshevik or something like that in, in 1917 Russia. You know, you just got to 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 toe the line. We're getting used to that. Okay. Uh, so, but that's but people weren't educated into it they were just bludgeoned into it but people still have religions they still have religious feeling they still have uh, traditions and family and uh, uh, home uh, domestic uh, cult that they carry on and so the pagan gods just took up residence in the uh, christian saints in germany in scandinavia everywhere and it's no different than you see in the Caribbean or, or wherever. It's the same thing. It takes yeah. about 300 to 400 years for that to change someone, a religious historian, a guy had a man who wrote the book, uh, The Germanization of Early Medieval Christianity, uh, Professor, you know, gives that estimate of number three to 400 years for a people, uh, to actually convert to Christianity, to become, or any religion, probably Buddhism, whatever, any kind of universalistic uh, Islam, you name it, they usually retain their own beliefs and just dress them up in acceptable forms for generations before that finally gets completely forgotten. But then, of course, we have examples where the Icelanders or whoever preserved the original templates, and so you can revive them. And that's mm -hmm. where this word comes in to my uh, estimation of the runes, is that uh, they were, they survived for a long time, but then they did eventually virtually die out. 
knowledge of them. And so then people had to go to books to learn about them. And that at that point, you can talk about a revival, that there really was a kind of a deadness. There was a, you know, an outer deadness. But the reason people, some people, do respond to runes, even the look of them, as uh, being attractive uh, is what I, I believe is an atavism, you know, something that's in us. But uh, even if it's like, oh, that's spooky, because most people who saw runes, like I said, only 1% of the population were ever literate in pagan times. Uh, but still people saw a stone or whatever, and they would see those runes on there, and they'd go, oh, that's kind of taboo. You know, you don't want to touch it. You don't want to. You're just going to be in awe of it. It's it's full of magic. You know, it's full of some kind of power. A lot of times the stones were carved on stones. Uh, those inscriptions were carved on stones, which were already uh, kind of sacred stones, you know, from megalithic times or from from the Stone Age. So... Uh, that's kind of typical. Sometimes you see a rune, runic inscription on a stone, and then they'll see, oh, look, if you look real carefully, you can see Bronze Age, older uh, iconography, symbols and signs that are on that stone also from earlier times. So they keep resacralizing this stone with new symbols, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So that happens. I know when you said the Caribbean stuff, I uh, lately have been looking up Papa Leg, but I know they kind of have a Peter reference, which I've been trying to figure that out. And uh, I see, I, I'm still trying to figure it out, but I know I was looking through the the Papa Leg, but like artwork and stuff of him, you know, with the top hat and the skull. And I'm like, well, how is that Peter? Which I know they have their reasons, but that's kind of like similar to what you're talking about with some of these connections, right? Yes, all of them are that. I mean, that's uh, you know, and it gets re uh digested all the time whereas uh, something for example in the caribbean you'll have the uh, slaves uh, who were then retained their as much of their religious tradition as they could but they uh, they interpreted these saints that were put up in front of them uh, in which they were forced to worship as their own gods and goddesses but then as other things started to come into their world, typical of traditional people, like, for example, when the sixth and seventh books of Moses show up, you know, uh, they incorporate that, too. You know, it's not like uh, not like uh, we, we think people or religious people or dogmatic people uh, say, oh, that's not our thing so we 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 have to uh, avoid that and, and and keep pure and keep these foreign things away traditional peoples generally don't think that way just like the runes themselves they are based on the roman alphabet i mean they're not just invented out of nothing they are roman letters reinvented for germanic purposes reordered renamed Resignified and all sorts of things, but you look at the F rune, it's obviously based on the Latin F. The U is, Urus is just the U turned upside down. Thurisa, the third rune, is, uh, is obviously some kind of invention because, again, Latin didn't have a, a letter for that sound. You know, and that, so each one was handled. It was probably, scholars hold, that uh, the runes were in invented, the system of the runes was invented by a single man and then spread from his school or uh, from his prestige throughout all Germanic tribes fairly quickly and, and retained their integrity of being 24 signs in this order with this signic significance through centuries of time and that was probably you know, rely, relied on the prestige of a pre-existing cultic network of some kind into which this system was inserted mm -hmm. and upon which the, the upon which the prestige of which these runes proliferated 
And and I know most of our audience is probably familiar with the Odin story with the runes, but when it comes to that story, I was just kind of curious to some of your perspective on it. I know all I know is he kind of hung upside down and saw them. What led to that exactly? Why did he do that? I mean, where did he get the knowledge to do that to begin with? Well, we don't know that. I mean, you know, that doesn't give a backstory. It starts off, I know that I hung on a windy tree, nights all night, given to Odin, myself to myself. And so uh, it's a self-sacrifice to self because he is Odin. Typical Odinic sacrifice is hanging. We don't really know he was upside down. I mean, that's, it, the text doesn't indicate that. That's just speculation. Uh, but uh, uh, an Odinic sacrifice, we know a lot about that because there's depicted constantly, you know, regularly. Uh, one very you know, detailed description in one saga. Uh, typically, he says, a wounded by spear. Geri undav, wounded by the spear. Uh, and what they do is they hang a person. Uh, by the neck, usually there's old uh, images of people being hung on a tree on a, uh, on trees on and they're carved into some picture stones in Gotland for example and so uh, they would hang them uh, that way and uh, gods received sacrifice human sacrifice uh, for what we would call today or called traditionally in the recent past of our history uh, criminal offenses if someone was a uh, committed crimes of any kind, they thought of them as the, the disharmonies in the divine order. So if, some, if a man deserted in battle, that was an affront to Odin. So he gets hung. You know, Another person commits some kind of uh, sexual picadillo or something like that. That's an offense to the goddess. You know, the way was she will receive him in the earth, and so they will put him in a bog alive and press him down with wicker work, drown him in the bog. And that rebalances that crime by 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 re uh, allocating that energy to make them pay for their crime in honor of the god or goddess whom they offended, and so. Oh, the Odinic sacrifice was hanging in a tree. It's kind of interesting. You know the word, the, the name of the place, famous place in England, called Stonehenge. Of course, it's a yes. uh, ancient megalithic site, pre-Celtic place. But the word, the name, is an Anglo-Saxon word. Stone, obviously, stone, stone, it's not an English word. And hinge is a place where things are hung. You hang the door on the hinge, right? Yes. It was used as a gallows for executions by the Anglo-Saxons as they were fighting against the Britons, uh, either their own deserters or the prisoners of war. Germanic peoples oftentimes didn't take prisoners of war. Uh, you see in the Edda, it reflects again an Odinic thing wherein the, the god Odin uh, they engage in the first battle of the universe of the Aesir against the Vanir and Odin throws the spear over them and gives the opposition to to the gods you see and that's what uh, ancient Germanic warriors did is they hurled a, a ceremonial spear into the opposition and they would declare that all of those who were killed today in battle on the other side are sacrifices to the gods. They sacralized war. And that uh, we carry that on, that Germanic ideal to this day, because uh, they considered battle a, there's an old Norse word for it, vakna domer, which means weapon judgment, like a court judgment. And that's how our legal system works to this day, an adversarial prosecutor versus defending attorney model, where you have trial by ordeal by proxy. That's how the courts today to this day work. And that's uh, this Germanic mindset about how do you get to the 
the truth through this adversarial process. So it's uh, something that's uh, an ancient idea that goes all the way back into those times. And that's yeah. the spear that uh, Odin is sacrificed by, see, and then so that's how he's giving himself to himself. And at the moment, he doesn't die. He almost dies, apparently. But then at a certain moment, he takes up the runes. Nam mekup runar, I pandi nam. I took up the runes, a screaming, I took them. So it's tied to a vocal performance, and he just takes them in. He just he sees and apprehends the secrets of the universe, takes them in, falls down from the tree, and begins to carve runes, begins to express them in the world. One word leads to another word. One deed leads to another deed, he says, and so forth. And so this is like the sacred moment where it's kind of like the, the, in 2001 where the, where the monkeys on the, you know, are using bones and things and they touch that monolith, right? And boom, the next thing you know, we're in outer space. It's this just opening of the mind to the, to the mysteries and what it does. For the for the human mind and will, hey, and that's uh, what's being described there. Hey, Stephen and uh, Wham Wham, if you would take the ship for a minute, I'll still be here. But uh, my dog's sixteen and he's having some health issues. I'm going to go adjust. Oh him, yes, I'll yes, still be listening. To be I, taken care of. Yes, I, 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 she, I, I, I'll, wondered, I'll be. I wondered if that was what was going on there. I could hear him barking in the background. <laughs> hi, hi, Stephen. My dog is with me, but he's not barking today. That's good. Yeah, well, I, I I locked the cat out so <laughs> so she wouldn't ask for food in the middle of this. Um, first of all, I just uh, I I want to say to you, um, for me, um, I have been following your work for about forty years, and um, and I know that you have done a lot and have met a lot of people and have done a lot of things in in your life, but way back way back in the in the I guess it would have been the early 80s mid 80s mm -hmm. um, right after you published your, your book Futhark right. you, and, you and I did correspond a little bit I still have okay. your letters and uh, um, and what I, I I was really happy to to be able to ha look at this book because there's a portion of it it's towards the towards the latter part of the book um, that explained to me kind of what had happened to me in the early, I guess it would have been the early 1980s, and this was before Futhark came out. Uh -huh. um, I, I had an experience uh, with a woman uh, in a completely different context. Um, I, I used to do the Renaissance festivals back then. Right. And, uh, um, and and at one point we had a this was in Kansas City, Missouri. And at one point we had a troop of firewalkers come through, you know, and they were actually not coming through just for the Renaissance Festival, but they were sort of just coming through the area. You know, they were on tour of the United States or something. And mm -hmm. so since they happened to be in the same place at the same time, they were invited to go do stuff at the Rena come and do stuff at the Renaissance Festival. And I met a woman there whose name was Kirsten. And she was of Swedish Finnish heritage. Um, mm -hmm. and, and she taught me how to firewalk. Now that was, that was just how we got to know each other. Um, she, and for some reason, she's going to be in town like for about a month. And for some reason, she took a liking to me. Who knows why? Uh, and and uh, she, we, over a course of about two or three weeks, it's hard to remember because it was a long time ago, she basically gave me sort of a, a, a kind of a download of her family's traditions of the runes. Um, she lived in this Darla Darlana, or mm -hmm, yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, and she um, t told me – she gave me a, t a series of techniques. It, it wasn't – and it wasn't the 16 runes that they talk about – that you talk about in your book. It was actually the 24. 
but it was based on the way that she gave them. It was almost like she transmitted them to me. You know what I mean? It was like she in, she insisted that I memorize a lot of stuff, you know, that instead of writing it all down. And, you know, I had to go through these mental exercises, very intense. And and she taught me a series of techniques whereby to kind of energetically use the runes in, in I think, in, in ways that sort of um, – I sort of learned how to use them before I really, you know, in a nonlinear way, I'll put it that, that's about the only way I can put it. Um, and, and so, um, and then she told me at the, you know, which, cause she had to travel on, you know, she had to go continue on her tour. And she basically said, um, well, you know, you've got this information now. And at some point it will open up at some point they'll, you'll have some dreams and other stuff will happen and you'll just, you know, it'll just happen. And so I just sort of had to wait. And then I, it was like maybe a couple of years later that Ralph Bloom's book came out and it, the book, the book itself I could care less about. Right. It was like, I looked at the book, mm-hmm. it was like whatever, but I saw the forms again, you know what I mean? Sure, and it was yeah. like, mm-hmm. that, that just sort of, just the forms sort of started mm-hmm. up in me. Right. And, well, and, you know, you can see in my book, I think I, I must go into it in some detail uh, there, uh, uh, there elsewhere. You know, that I wrote my first rune book in 1975. Right. And right. Uh, they and, and they were supposed to be, oh, we'll publish this. You know, a pub, big publisher wanted to do it. But then they came back and said, uh-uh. well, business guys say runes won't sell. Right. That was 1975. Right. But uh, I'm glad that didn't happen, you know, as I think I point out at some point. You know, it's like because I was working with the Armanin system, you know. Right, right. And that kind of a thing. Right. And so that's not really, you know, exactly right. So the old man, as I call Odin familiar, yeah. familiarly, yeah. you know, said, son, you got to go back to school. <laughs> this isn't <laughs> exactly. good enough. And that's typical of of of, Odin, of a relationship with Odin will not necessarily just say, oh, you want this? I'll give you that. You ask nice, i give you that. He says, no, you're here to serve a higher purpose, and if you're doing something wrong, the thing that I will do is I will thwart you. And then right. if right. you're thwarted and you give up and you quit, then, you know, goodbye, you're out. No, uh, right. But if you say, well, that's got to be, I've got to persevere. I've got to find another way. There's something that's intended by this failure is not just a rejection, but maybe a redirection. And that's exactly what it was. Right. And then, and then what happened with me was that, you know, then your book came along, Futhark. And Mm -hmm. that helped a lot. That, that helped me. It wasn't exactly what I'd been taught, you know what I mean? And it was a different style you know, um, than what I, than what she had given me, but it was something, you know, and so I was able to, uh, begin a process of, of really starting to, it took a while though for me to, to figure out how to coalesce all this stuff together, um, for myself. I mean, I did eventually go back to school. I did eventually, you know, study some German and Icelandic and Anglo-Saxon myself, you know, that's not what I got my degrees in because, you know, I also have other interests. But um, one of the things that 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 then happened, at, at like maybe three years ago, was that I ran into and this you talk a little bit about this in this book. I ran into um, Tom, Thomas Carlson's um, yeah. description of the Uthark. And mm-hmm. I went. Really I realized when I looked at that and then I read uh, and then I read your stuff about it, I realized, oh, you know, she didn't call it that. And I don't yeah. think it was that exactly, but I think that there was some influence of the school in what she sure. was talking about. Yeah. Because she what she talked about was there was family stuff that you know older traditions but that but that um the but the numerological stuff that she used with right. me was very similar to the Uthark stuff so when once I was exposed to that I was like oh that's what that was you know although I've, I've used Futhark for 
forever, you know. So for me, sure. either either one is fine as far as I'm concerned for my own work. Yes, uh, well, Agrel, Sigurd Agrel, the guy who did the, you know, the Fusark theory back starting in the 1920s or thereabouts in Sweden, you know, is extremely influential. He's, you know, wrote a lot of books in you know, Swedish and German. And so they, uh, have you, do you know my book, The, the Meiji in Tarok? Oh, yes, I have it. No. Uh, Okay, so that, you know, that's uh, really Sigurd Agro, the guy that did the, the Usark theory. Right. Uh, it was his work that that book is based on. It's not so much my thing. I put a, more things in there and some more insights that he didn't have about Iranian things and so forth. But uh, but basically it's his theory, and then you can see how he, he wrote a book on the Tarot. Right. Uh, and he used this same system to explain it, and it really makes – that's where he really makes sense. Uh, his Uthark theory, you know, is, just has no uh, – what happened there, I do believe, is if you just read, like, uh, books on runology, and uh, it'll have in there somewhere about codes, and one of the codes that was right. used sometimes was shifting the values of letters by one slot. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. the way I think that the Uthark theory is explained. It's not really there was no Uthar, there was no right. F, you know, with them moving to the end like a Joker or something, but rather it was just a coded shift, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps. It, so that right. uh, could be the explanation there. But with that shift, if you look at the Roman things and the symbols that he teases out and connects it to the tarot, lining them up, it really makes sense. Right, yeah. So, so I mean, I have found it to be useful. Uh, you know, I mean, my own, you know, the, the, the technique that she taught me, uh, I mean, even though it recognized all the forms of the Futhark, and, and, she, and she did talk about the order of them, you know, because the order is important in a lot of ways, sort of symbolically, you know, depending on whether you're doing triads or dyads or whatever, you know, that there are, there are important symbolic sort of meta meanings and, and, and layerings that can come with all of that. She actually taught me, like I said, it was a less, um, it was a more, associative um, uh-huh. um, visual way of, of working with them, almost a kind of a sigil kind of way of working with the forms, seeing them grow into each other and morphing from each other right. from central patterns. And, and so, yeah. So, so that's, that's sort of how I, I, I started learning about it all. Um, one of the things, so, so, you know, I just was, I, I guess I, what I was really happy about in reading your book here is I was like, oh, you know, it's, it's nice to see connections. It's nice to know, oh, okay, this really happened. This was real stuff. This was connected to something, you know. I mean, that's, that's, that's all, uh, it, that's important for me because it affirms, uh, experiences and and knowledge um, that you know I was given and that um, I that well, is useful for me in my life. You know, um, I I have had some really extraordinary dreams. I mean, Odin comes to me in dreams mostly, and so because uh, that's what I do most of my work in. And uh, it was it was maybe a couple of years after she had left. Um, and given me this download that I had a series of dreams about him where um, I basic I basically was told, you know, I was shown a sigil and and I was told when you see the sigil again, you're, you're misunderstanding the sigil right now. But when you see the sigil again, you'll know that it's time for the next stage. What you know, whatever that was. So about four years ago. Out of the blue, I was doing other things. I had a dream, and that sigil appeared again within an Odinic context. And that, and that's when I started doing reworking about all this stuff. So uh-huh. it's like people who don't believe people who don't believe this stuff is real. They, they just haven't worked with it at all, you know. Um, so right, it's a kind of. Uh, it's a kind of thing that really requires a, a, a life of devotion to it and patience for right. it to uh, work its way out. It, it's in there, 
it, it just has to find a way to make its way through the noise, you know. And uh, so, you know, I hope that in this book I show that well, what we're doing, we're groping our way, you know, to, to discover this thing that uh, in ancient times people could just. And the way you receive this information from this person is very much a, akin uh, to the way in which runic and uh, uh, knowledge was passed. It's best not, uh, thought that uh, such information passed from person to person, and it was exclusively men at that time at the, for centuries. We know that because it refers to masculine only, you know, carvers and so forth. Right, right. Uh, and so, you know, women had their thing, men had their thing. And it was a warrior cult originally, you know, warrior bands and things like that. And they got together at these um, uh, places for religious festivals, but also that's where trade was carried out. It would be like a carnival, you know, I mean, entertainment, everything. They come together from far and wide through the woods and so forth. They do these things. And around the campfire, the fellows that are interested in such things pass this information to their fellows, though, who were generally poets, professional reciters, uh, sometimes thought of as entertainers, but they weren't necessarily uh, the way we think of entertainers, right? They were repositories of lore, but also of news, right? They would go from tribe to tribe and bring news from other parts of the world, and uh, that they would be, of course, welcomed always into, even if the tribes were warring, if a storyteller poet came, uh, oh, we're going to have him here because he's going to entertain, he's going to tell us stuff we need, we want to know. You know, and so that's how runes passed throughout these intertribal networks uh, mm-hmm. that were um, sort of the tradesmen, the poets, and so forth. But that was a very much uh, the kind of situation you described with your uh, uh, Swe- Swedish Finnish friend who was at a car at a festival type thing, a temporary thing, comes, passes information, and moves on. Right, exactly. I mean, that's that's exactly mm-hmm. how it was. I mean, it was, and uh, you know, I and and what was interesting was that she was not really concerned about us ever having contact again. You know, it was kind of like mm-hmm. here's the stuff. Um, for some reason, I feel like I need to tell you this, and of course, I was interested, and because I'm always interested in mystical or spiritual things, and especially then, I was really needing something. And, uh, you know, it's no matter what else I do in my life, and I've done a lot of other spiritual things in my life and have been involved with a lot of different types of communities, the the runes stay with me. They they just Mm. come with me wherever I go. They influence everything else that I do. Um, They are the foundations for my connection to the planet, you know, um, and to spirit and it's 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 a an incredible it's I feel like the ancestors are just sort of always with me you know wherever I go yeah. through them, um, and uh, so I'm and I'm grateful for your part in that too because you've you've played really important parts at certain periods in time you know sort of connecting me with various types of uh, you know different ways of looking at things and and resources and and. Uh, so it's been really, you know, you've been an important person in my life. So I, I want to say that to you. I think it's oh, important. That you, that. I think that it's important yeah. that you do that, and not not only in terms of the rune stuff, but you know, even though we're not talking about this so much anymore, some of your 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 more recent um, work with Iranian religion, because mm-hmm. I, yeah. I have always been a complete and total fanatic freak about Persian Iranian stuff for whatever reason I have no idea I've always figured it must be past life stuff so your book your book of original magic is like oh, I need another copy it's already worn completely <laughs> you know you know it's so it's, uh, I've, I've you know yeah. I, I well like- that's uh, the you know we have this there's an artifact I, I have it in my, my book you have, you have my book on the the goths the mysteries of the goths it's, you can get it on Amazon. Yes, but anyway, yes, uh, do, there's, a, there's a, a chapter in there, you know, about the spears and the sacred spears, the Germanic, right. the Goths, and so forth. And they're, they're these spearheads 
that have runes and tamgas on them, which oh. are tamgas are Sarmatian, that's a new Iranian step people, uh, uh, family crests, if you will. I say branded their horses with it and so forth, but it was their uh, identity, you know. And so you'll see this spear, and it has runes and a swastika on there, which, you know, a hot and cross thing, uh, a trife. Oil and then uh, tamgas and so forth, and so forth. And this was be a, a scepter, you see. It would be a. It was not a weapon. It was a spearhead, but it was not used as a weapon. Uh, we know that because it's it's clean. It was never used in battle. Uh, but it, it's a scepter, like of the king or chieftain, and on that appear the symbols of the people in his group, in his kingdom, in his entourage. You know, and so we know that the Sarmatians and the you know, that's where the, the whole theory about the Arthurian legends being of Iranian origin. Huh. Uh, there was a, the, uh, some, we'll just call them Sarmatians, that were uh, fought in the Marcomanni Wars with the Romans. They fought with the, the Germans, the Germanic peoples, and uh, they were defeated by the Romans. And... Uh, because these Sarmatians were such cavalrymen, they were Romans, uh, incorporated them into their army, but they don't leave them there uh, in Central Europe, where it's now Czech Republic area. Rather, they send them to Hadrian's Wall to <laughs> station them there. And uh, then, uh, so people look at these Iranian myths and legends, the Nart sagas, they're called, and see, there's a lot of patterns in here that are similar to Arthurian stories and uh, so forth. So there's a whole book written I called uh, the Sith Ca 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 Camelot and Scythia or something like that. But uh, anyway, the Germanic peoples and these Iranian peoples were very closely related culturally. In fact, the art form that we so identify with the Celtic people and the Germanic peoples, these sort of animal forms that are kind of abstract looking, right. that's from Iranian art. Uh, that comes directly from Iranian influence. Uh, they came into Central Europe around 700 B.C. I mean, they were there forever. Tacitus talks about them and so forth. Right. And sometimes they war with the people, sometimes they're friends. You know, obviously these all these artifacts show that, history shows that. Uh, the tribes get along, they fight. They get along, they fight. Uh, and But that we know, hey, look at this art. That means the Celtic peoples of Central uh, Europe, that's where the Celts are originally from, and the Germanic peoples, all of their art typical art forms are of Iranian origin, of steppe origin. Step origin. So uh, the, with that, well, there was a uh, a real symbiosis there. and, and a cross. In fact, a lot of the uh, mythic qualities, uh, Yggdrasil, a lot of things of the, the cosmic tree and a whole lot of other things. I wrote an article on the Germanic uh, Iranian connection in uh, the journal comes out once every once in a while called Tyr, T-Y-R, and there's a, in the fifth volume of that, uh, uh, there, I have an article in there about these connections, mythic connections, art connections, all kinds of connections between this Iranian peoples, these Scythian Sarmatians and so forth, and the uh, Germanic peoples, which are enormous. And they probably gave a lot of the really basic things. And the reason for why it's so profound an influence on the Germanic peoples is that the, the Germanic peoples don't really come into being as a separate ethnic group until about that time, about 700 B.C., right. when these influences were all converging. And, uh, of course, ancient peoples had a tough time separating what they called Scythians from Goths. They, they kind right. of confused right. and they looked similar. Uh, a lot of people here, a lot of sort of racist types and so forth, you know, hear, oh, the Scythians and Sarmatians, they come from the east and they're Iranian somehow or another. So they must be, you know, swarthy oriental types or something. No, they were described by the Greeks as 
tall, strawberry hair, blue eyes, green eyes, etc. They look just like the uh, uh, the uh, you know Germanic Celtic people. So they they weren't uh, at odds in appearance at all with the, with those people. They were a diff- from a different place, and they spoke a dialect that no one, you know, others couldn't understand. It wasn't really directly related. They're Indo-European. They are distantly related to Germanic and Celtic languages, but, you know, just another Indo-European group. But but they got along well. As they, you know, they looked like they were they intermarried and so forth. You know, the, the Huns who were a Turkic people, but they interbred with the Goths very early on. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the name, the most famous Hun of all is, what's his name? Attila. What is that? It's a Gothic name meaning little father. Atta is father in Gothic, the Germanic dialect of Gothic. The Gothic Bible starts off, uh, or you know, in the Lord's Prayer, it starts off, Atta Unsar. Our father. So, uh, Attila, Attila is the way he was saying, you know, is, uh, it's like the Gothic names. They had all sorts of Gothic names, these Huns. And they were just, uh, uh, people weren't, you know, people think the way these 19th century type people, oh, you know, those people are different and, you know, all this kind of ethnic kind of conflict. No, there really wasn't that at all. Uh, in ancient times, and they had conflicts, but they weren't based on ethnic identity. You know what I mean? Well, the, yeah, they weren't. But based they had on their differences. Yeah, yeah, and they weren't based on you know they weren't based on the kinds of things that we think about now at all. That's true. No, not at all. Not at all. Just like the ba- the Battle of Clontarf, you know, the the Irish try to make that into you know nineteenth century historians blah blah blah. They try to make that into a story of a uh, liberation of Ireland from the Norse oppressor and so forth. But at the battle itself, there were as many Norsemen on the Irish side and as many Irishmen on the Norse side. They were loyal to certain lords right. personally. It wasn't, they didn't think in national terms. They might think in tribal or clanic terms, our family and our who we're loyal to and who our uh, differences are with and so forth, but they weren't national identities at all well they didn't have nations as such like we have no, no. That, you know no, that's uh, but we re but people re constitute the past into the image of the present and think in terms of germans and french and this and that and the other thing and it just wasn't there i just like france itself it's, uh, it has a german name the, the oh. franks were the uh, uh you know, founded the, the state of France, Francia, Francia, the land of the Franks. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I used to tell my, when I taught, I used to teach um, the history of Europe, uh, you know, so oh, sur- cool. a survey class. And I would, I, I, one of the things that I would say about Northern Europe is like, you don't, you don't want to tell like the English and the French and the Germans this, but they're, they're kind of all the same people. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, sort of, you know, I mean, there are different tribes and ethnicities in there, but, you know, we have a lot of Germanness running around here. So Germanic types running around here. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, well, certainly. you know, um, we're not talking about radically different people, like from an indigenous. No, no the radical differences came about for practical you know, re- reasons they were more not uh, like religious, like uh, Jonathan Swift writing about the Lilliputians and people killing each other because they cut their eggs from one end or the other and other nonsense like that. Yeah. And that's kind of what these ethnic uh, animosities remind me of just that, you know, because people should uh, ideally uh, have their loyalties and their differences uh, based on things that are much closer to their hearts than these abstract uh, things, which are so easily manipulated by politicians and priests and you name it, oh, you yeah. know. But if you're uh, close to home, your life is close to home, and the people that you are your people, close there, not 
abstractly what you're watching on TV and nonsense like that, but people close to you, personally known to you. That is the way it was and the way it tends to still be, but uh, we get confused very easily. Yeah. By, well, uh, we, we've A lot of people have lost the ability to um, just – Focus on more than one thing at a time. You know, there's no very, very. Stay very, home and sit still. Well, yeah, actually, <laughs> have, an, have an inner life. You know, an yeah. inner life with 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 people that you're close to. Well, before I give you over to Jeffrey, there's one more thing that because this this is a this is a, something that uh, is part of your book, and I think it's an important part of your book because it's an important thing that some people will be thinking about that you've written about before. But one of the things that you do in this book, which I think is significant in the book, is that you you work quite a bit to sort of um, what's the word exactly? Liber- I don't know if liberates quite the right word, but set the record straight about Guido von List. Uh-huh. And so uh-huh. if you could talk a little bit about that, uh, you know, and explain briefly who Guido von List wa- is, was, he's not, uh-huh. he's not, he's dead now. Well, and, he's not with uh, us anymore, no. He's not with us anymore. And, and why it's <laughs> important to rehabilitate his, his, his reputation. Well, uh, we can rehabilitate. He was an honest uh, mystic, a theosophist, uh, and a poet, and a writer, and so forth, who had genuine spiritual experiences, and so forth. But uh, he wasn't a scholar, and so when he had his vision of the runes, he uh, based his uh, uh, views on what he knew uh, from his immediate traditions of uh, Christianity and, and so forth, that the scripture, the written word, should hold a great uh, prestige and place of uh, power. So he uh, based a system on this poem we were talking about earlier, where Odin hangs himself on the tree and so forth. Then he proceeds to sing um, eventually uh, 18 songs, and so list based a runic system on that poem and on the stanzas of that poem and uh, had a a sort of mystical view of language that was uh, based on sound and sound similarities and so forth. And uh, he was an artist, a writer, artist, so forth. He was a a nationalist, but most people were. He just died 1919. It was just at the end of the uh, First World War. And uh, if you read his stuff, which I read in the original German and so forth and translated some of it, uh, he was uh, not what people, his own followers immediately made him into after his death, immediately thereafter. Because immediately after the the Germans lost, the Germans and the Austrians lost the uh, uh, First World War uh, under very sketchy circumstances in their minds, uh, they got really pissed off. They got really angry, resentful, and hateful, you know, towards the, the raw deal they got and so forth. And uh, Guido von List was sort of reformed a lot of his ideas into this kind of more radical, nationalistic uh, viewpoint, which he didn't necessarily hold. He he uh, was fine with Jewish people. Where he writes uh, nicely, you know, about them uh, and the traditions of Kabbalah and all of that, and that the, there was some kind of medieval uh, symbiosis between the ancient Germanic peoples and the, the Jewish people, and they kind of cross fertilizing. He spoke positively about it, as well as Freemasonry. I, I have a book, a little book. You can get it on Amazon called uh, Freemasonry and the Germanic Tradition. And it shows how a lot of the Freemason uh, rituals and all kinds of things are based on Germanic liturgy or legal uh, uh, procedures and so forth. And he wrote a, an article on that once and uh, spoke glowingly in, uh, of Freemasonry and such. Uh, but then a- after this, they said, no, Freemasons are terrible, conspiracy, international conspiracy, you know, and all the anti-Semitism and everything. And they would, his followers would kind of 
when they republished and said, well, the master didn't know, you know, that this was all so bad when he wrote this. Oh, you know, he wouldn't write this today, but, and so forth. So he was sort of moved in that direction. And unfortunately, a very unfortunate thing was uh, that like people like Nicholas Goodrick Clark, Mm -hmm. you know, see, you know, like, oh, somehow Guido von List leads to Auschwitz, right? Mm -hmm. That, That somehow there's a direct connection between these two things, between Guido von List, the Armand tradition, and Nazism, and there is not. I have a a book coming out. I just signed or just got the contract yesterday on the, this subject. I'm not going to go into it too much detail here, but uh, it'll be a huge, my biggest book of all time, uh, over 400 pages, <laughs> uh, almost 200,000 words uh, on this topic that's kind of here and it can be uh, traced that uh, that these things are not uh, you know not connected really but they get connected by people who, who who see similarities of course there were things in 1919 or whenever the early uh, 20th century of uh, these these people these nazis for example the men who were in the nazis was hitler himmler whoever you know these people were born mostly in the 1890s and there was a thing in Germany, and it has nothing to do with Nazism or anything, but it is a huge movement, still alive today, called the Reform Movement, the Reform of Life Movement. And uh, there you have nudism and uh, homeopathy, and you name it, it's a widespread thing. And these people were involved in that. Guido von List was an exponent of it, and all of these men who formed National Socialism but were also children of this. This is why we hear about Rudolf Hess, you know, the guy who flew to try to make right. peace with the English. He was like, you know, all organic food. Hitler himself was an anti-vivisectionist, vegetarian, teetotaler. These were all t- characteristics of the reform people, you know. There were even Nazi nudist groups, you know, and things like this. This kind of thing was widespread. Uh, that doesn't, ex- you know, it, it just is that these people were uh, very much different than a lot of people try to make them out to be. It doesn't excuse their crimes, uh, which were n- numerous and terrible, you know. But, it, but to understand what was actually going on in this culture is always the best tactic, you know, is to truly understand what was going on. Right. Well, it's always understand to, it's always best to understand rather than just to villainize, you know. Right. Because you can understand it and say that is wrongheaded. This is why it was wrong. This is where it went wrong. If you don't understand, uh, you see what happened there. And uh, this is a warning contemporarily that uh, if you start to get like these people did, uh, if you get into a bad situation, you feel you're desperate, like the Germans were after the end of the First World War, you know, had wheelbarrows full of cash to buy bread, things like that, starving, dying of starvation in the city, so forth and so on. And you feel like somebody has done me wrong. Somebody's responsible here. And you are in an atmosphere where radical, crazy ideas have somehow become acceptable alternatives in your mind. Unreasonable, irrational ideas have become acceptable in your mind. It's acceptable solutions to your problems. You're on the road to fail, you know, because, you know, reason, logic, uh, Understanding, uh, awareness uh, is much better than just I'm sick, I'm, I'm, I'm scared, I am uh, threatened, I am scared of what's happening, and I am willing to do anything to make it stop or do something about it. And I, and, and if I can identify, if somebody, an enemy, can be identified, you know, Hitler writes about in Mein Kampf. Is I wasn't an anti-Semite. My father wasn't. I wasn't. I, I, I didn't give a hang about it one way or the other. He said, but then I wanted to create 
a movement. And to do that, I needed an enemy. I needed someone to focus on that way, you know, to bind us together. And the Jews were the only choice. There was no other, you know, choice for that tactic. It's a wrong tactic. It's stupid. But that's what that was. It was a conscious strategy. Well, on the, Jews, on the Jews had been a target before, you know, they had been oh, yeah. a target. Well, it wouldn't have, they wouldn't have been, what things that happened couldn't have happened if, and I point this out in my uh, forthcoming book very uh, in great detail or some detail about uh, the, the, uh, the church, both Protestant and Catholic, were on a rampage against the Jews and had been for centuries, right? Exactly. So that when, the Hitler Hitlerian kind of anti Semitism came along, it was like nothing new. The 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 the, uh, the Fritzes and the and the uh, you know so forth, just the ordinary German guy uh with low education and so forth, what we'd call a bubba or something here, you know, we're we're all preconditioned for that kind of thinking. For centuries they'd been that way. The churches had taught them this. You know, that the, the Jews are the killers of Christ, blah, 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 and all these things. That they had. It was all that. And so then the Nazis came along with a new rationale to keep up with science and whatever, you know, that kind of thing. And But it was preconditioned. It could have never happened if – Auschwitz could not have happened without centuries of uh, church – based anti-Semitism, you know, which pre-prepared pre, uh, the way for that sort of thing. And yeah. the Russians and the Poles and so forth were carrying out pogroms, at the, you know, just prior to that where they just went in and killed them wholesale in their villages and so forth. And uh, so that was certainly you know, nothing that... Uh, is uh, uh, something that was connected to anything remotely Germanic. I, I come across so many people, Germanic enthusiasts, pagans, etc., so forth, and they express these sympathies for, you know, uh, anti-Semitism, that sort of thing. And I tell them, I mean, I say, look, <laughs> read the Edda. Is there any, do they ever mention anything about this sort of thing? No. Do they, uh, for example, in my book about the Goths, uh, outsiders, the, the Christians, the Roman Christians, uh, identified the Goths and the Jewish people because they got along so well together. You know, they were like buddies. So uh, it's uh, a travesty as to what has been done to our tradition, both from the outside which is expected because they will identify us as enemies because we're giving an alternative mythology. But then it is more reprehensible that we get this kind of resistance from the inside of this misunderstanding, which only makes us weak because it's based on error and things that are not true and things that are counterproductive. And so, uh, well, it's based on that's one of the things I try to. I try to be. I mean, I'm a trained academic teacher, blah blah blah, you know. And so, reason, or at least in the old days, I don't know so much now, but in the old days, it was like reason, logic, logical analysis of data, and coming to uh, conclusions that are based on reason, not on emotion <clears throat> or wishful thinking or whatever. And so uh, that's the way I try to write my books, to try to – It's the, each one is a, an attempt to teach <clears throat> my readers, you know, not like I know better necessarily. Sometimes I do, factually, but, uh, but as far as the underlying attitude is uh, we need to approach problems from a reasonable perspective. And one that then opens the way to dialogue and discussion if one just – maintains a dogma that is irrational, there's no talking to that person on on any side, anywhere. You know, there's no point of discussion at that point because their minds are made up and, you know, that's it. 
and that's not a healthy way to live individually or otherwise. Right. It's it's difficult to get along with neighbors that way, certainly. (laughs) (laughs) I have have returned. My my dog, I was just going to say, he's been sick for a few weeks, so, I mean, he may not be with us too much longer, but he definitely, he was sick, and then I prayed, and he started doing better, but now he's kind of slipping back, but... I've been with oh, him for yeah, a long, a long, thank you. I've been with him for a long time. I don't, it takes a lot to make me cry, but I have been ringing tears when the last time he got mm-hmm. sick and he's doing it now. So it's probably good on a heart, oh. heart attack level for me to cry like that too, yeah. <laughs> since I dealt that much. Right. But well, I know with, 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 it happens. Welcome to Planet Mother Trouble. Yeah, I know. Like Rob uh, uh, we, have, <laughs> we are, uh, we have a cat rescue. We have like, you know, a huge number. My wife's like a cat lady, you know, she's a, like, <laughs> Retired nurse, she takes care of them and does all kinds of medical things. And we live out in the country, and all the the dogs I have are the ones that have been dumped on the road out in front of our house. Oh man! You know, you know, yeah. people just dump them out there. Yeah, there's something about. I've got the- a lot of good dogs. In. Yeah, there's something about the country. I know when I lived in a very rural area in Kansas, people would do that with their dogs too. They would just dump their dogs. Yeah. Once, once some, yeah. somebody dumped a mom dog and three puppies, just dumped them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's just like, how can you dump animals? I just don't get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, I know they're inhuman. These are cr- cruel people. Uh, but, uh, yeah, one day, we sometimes we'd have, like, workmen over, you know, working on something. And we, we tried to not do that so much anymore because uh, next thing you know, you know, people are, because they see we have animals. So, oh, what's, you know, the, you want to get rid of that cat, honey? Okay. I'm going to take it over to those crazy cat people, you know. <laughs> and one, one one day we were sitting there watching TV, you know, we heard a door slam. You know, we like to live in a place where there should be nobody around. And then they drive off and we go out to look and there's a cat like running towards our house. Help me, help me. <laughs> Just ran right into our house, and you know, he's a great cat. But uh, they they didn't want him anymore. It was somebody that had, you know worked on their house, and just uh, thought, well, here are these people, you know. What I call sure, I call it shirker nation. People shirking their responsibilities, you know. Yeah. They don't uh, take. And uh, people uh, throw a cat away. The person soon they'll be throw, you know, they throw each other away too. Exactly. Exactly. You know. Yeah. And that's they, the kind of world I don't like. I want that. That uh, that's why I admire and study and, and admire and have sympathy and empathy for those people. I study these ancient peoples because they had a, a code of honor, behavior, and and uh, connection to one another that was what was, was supernatural. I mean, it was like something we cannot. Most people. Today, all loyalty is for the most part bought by, you know, people are loyal to their company as long as they pay them or whatever. But these people were loyal because of the oaths they swore, you know. And that makes a, a, uh, a bond, you know, that's just like, it's more powerful than blood in that culture. And there's a lot of uh, myths and legends about warriors where the, Son and father are separated, uh, and the son swears allegiance to an, a lord that is an enemy of his father. And the son and the father meet in battle, uh, like man on man kind of a thing. Uh, this is there's an Irish version of Cahulan and Conla, and in Germanic worlds, Hildebrand and Hadubrand is so it's apparently common. And they come and they say, "Okay, here we are." And it's the worst thing in the world you can do is kill your father or your son. That's like taboo. Uh, but we've sworn oaths. Which one wins the oath? And of course, that story never probably happened on occasion um, sometimes. But the story why it was a powerful legend is that's that heroic dilemma, kind of like a Hamlet, you know, where you to be or not to be. I have this moral dilemma. You know, I've got to kill. Of course, Hamlet is based on a Danish, on a Norse saga. And that's where he has his father has been killed by this man who has taken over his family and married his mother. So now he's my stepfather. 
but he's also the murderer of my father, who I'm uh, honor-bound to avenge, according to the code, yet he's my stepfather, which makes him taboo to kill. That is a moral dilemma, in Germanic style, see? And so you see all that, but that's these stories, they, where they come up? And that's when they struggle with these dilemmas about loyalty and obligation and so forth. It's a powerful uh, culture. And, of course, a, a forgotten, largely forgotten. We can romanticize or talk about it in a wistful term. But, you know, that's that was real life. That's how they didn't have welfare systems or governments to take care of them. They just had family, clan, and warrior band. That was the only way. You know, you had, there's one runic inscription that says, you know, if you tear down this runic inscription, this stone, you will die a wretched death, meaning someone separated from any kind of human community, you know, and you will be out alone, on your own, uh, and die a wretched, meaning a lonely, unconnected to other humans' death, which is the worst possible thing, you know. And that's why the the knight errant, what's called a, we, I, we get the word wretch, but in German, the same word comes out, recke, which means a kind of a lone knight, which we romanticize in Westerns and every other kind of way in our sort of American mythology. But that's what that is, someone out on their own, the lone ranger, you know, who's somehow broken the code, somehow an outlaw, but on his own. Now, that is a superhuman individual who can survive and do things in any kind of meaningful way apart from human connection you know so they, these myths one of the books I'd like to write is just a thing on, on our Germanic heritage and things like that you know would come up, come up that's the kind of thing where we see these things are still present in our mythic lives uh, but and where they come from you know, uh, which are very ancient and persistent. Nobody's telling us, oh, you need to believe this. Oh, let's sit down and do Bible study. Nobody's sitting down for studying the sagas or the eddas, yet these myths persist, unaided by dogma and coercion, you know. They're just in there, and they just come out. I think they're imprinted into our language, actually, you know. So uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, well, there's uh, a, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, uh, one of the books I, I, that will be coming out with the, uh, uh, the publisher called Arcana Europa pretty soon here uh, is a book, whole book on Odin, you know. It's a, a detailed study of the god Odin, his origins, all of the things about him. It's very uh, exhaustive kind of study. And since we talked about him so much here tonight, uh, I thought I would mention that. That's uh, coming out in probably in a, you know, less than a year, I'm sure. Oh. It's called uh, a Wodan. 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 Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, get that I originally sure. called it, I call, uh, called it Wozanath, but, you know, it's like too exotic sounding. And it doesn't go good on Amazon, a book uh, thing. When you tell, how do you ever see anything with an "s" and all these weird characters that you have to use to uh, be precise when you're talking about some of this stuff? Yeah, yeah there's, so. there's the marketing business. <laughs> yeah, you know, just just the real thing. I, the books has all that stuff in it. It's tough sometimes to publish, so we don't want to use those strange char- characters. That confuses people. But actually, like you look at some, you know, you see these words when they are spelled out with, uh, where they, instead of using an as, you know, a special character for the the sound, you know, it's a dh and things like that. It makes the word so dang long, you know. I mean, it looks unpronounceable uh, with without those symbols. It's, besides, again, you can learn to read those symbols. That takes about ten minutes <laughs> or less. <laughs> Mm-hmm. You see well, that? Definitely, that definitely that. grab, definitely get a hold of that one for sure. I know uh, one yeah. thing I wanted to ask you, just kind of uh, uh, 
get into your mind a bit about Loki. Uh, I know, was he like, I know, was he always kind of a villain or he really wasn't? And I know they mentioned him like in a hushed way, like they do with Christianity and Satan. It was never like that, was it? I'm just kind of curious to your perspective. Well, well obviously he was uh, uh, oftentimes in the company of the, of the gods, right? In the myths, he's, he's uh, in the, the entourage. He uh, said that the, uh, he and Odin are blood brothers, and the Edda mentions that, uh, and so forth. But just because someone is, you know, in the group doesn't mean they won't betray you, right? Yes. Uh, and that's what he did. So, I mean, Odin cannot forgive him. He's instrumental in the murder of his son, his favorite son. And so, uh, you know, that's just, don't you say, oh, well, you know, you plotted to kill my son, but eh, who cares? No, that's not happening. Again, that's not happening. So uh, that's where the villainy comes in. It's not so much that he's a trickster or he's mischievous. That's so. If we can use those skills to good purposes, you know, then fine. But then when you start killing the family, you know, come in, you know, and start plotting and getting uh, other god, Hother, and the blind god you know, to. Uh, to uh, be an instrument of your of your malice, you know that that's not cool. So you you're out. <laughs> you, uh, so you know you got to look at it from the not just like this is what this entity is. There's a narrative there, and uh, that says more than just he's a static figure. Uh, so that that's the key really to understanding. Look, he's not uh, well. Satan in the story of the Bible, of uh, Hebrew mythology is a little different, you know. Than uh, I mean, uh, Satan in the Hebrew Bible is not the arch enemy of uh, of God. He's the prosecuting attorney he's sitting right there with God. Book of Job, right? Uh, Jehovah and Satan are sitting there looking at this Job guy, and they're taking bets on, I bet I can break his face. I bet you can. He's my best man on earth. Uh, okay, we'll see. Okay. Try your best. See what happens. Uh, they're like they're like drinking buddies up there. You know? That's how it's described. So it's obviously not uh, the Christians influenced by turn Satan into a kind of like we're talking about the Iranian system, wherein the uh, evil one, that is Ariman, uh, is bad. There's nothing good about Ariman, in the, uh, the the Iranian devil, if you will. Uh, as you read uh, my, some of my books on that, uh, well, you know, because is, is disease good? Is disease ever good? Are, uh, uh, is death good? Do you want that death? No. You, you want life. You want is, is ignorance and stupidity. Those are the things that are evil in the Iranian viewpoint. That, that Those are the things that are evil, are always negative, always bad, never beneficial, hurt to man and beast and to the na to nature there are things in this world that are those things and only someone who's blind doesn't see that that's but see satan as even described as been the the uh, the devil in folklore and so forth and so on he has a positive side of magicians try to get him to do this that or the other he's not really uh, only in the western world in Christianity, does the devil uh, come out as a folk hero because he's the rebel, right? He rebels against oppression because, again, the Iranians invented the story that the Hebrews recast as the Garden of Eden story. That is a complete Iranian myth that was retooled by Babylonian Hebrews. Uh, Aramaic uh, Jews and so forth, the, uh, and they made it into something different than it originally was because, you see, uh, uh, the, the God that says, man, you need to be smart. You need to be intelligent. 
you uh, you know will not die. You are immortal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is something that God doesn't want, right? He says, no, you're going to turn them into gods, and that's precisely what the good god in the Iranian world, Ahura Mazda, the wise lord, wants for mankind. Each and in, every individual human being is a potential god form. These are the farvashis, the, the, the spiritual part of each and every individual human, because it, the, so the Iranian myth goes that all humans are incarnate spirits that volunteered to descend from the ramparts of the fortress of Ahura Mazda to come into this world to fight the good fight. But because of the uh, wiles, you know, of this uh, evil force, which causes people to become confused, forgetful, and they lo lose sight of who they really are, and that they are immortal, good creatures, uh, uh, that they, they then become confused and start to do bad things because they don't know, and they are confused, and they are told that a, that entity is constantly playing these tapes in your head you are stupid you are bad you are dying you are bad you will die etc etc just and when people are creatures are so uh, prone to believe the worst because they might feel weak or vulnerable that they're preyed upon by these forces that's the way that the the Iranians say it's more pure uh, purely philosophical uh, whereas the Judeo-Christian mythology is a mix of things, and so there's inconsistencies. Remember, all of us who've gone through this exercise where you say, God is all-powerful, all-seeing, and all-good. Well, that doesn't compute, right? It never computes. If that's true, then why doesn't God stop bad things from happening? He's all-powerful. The Iranian view is that Ahura Mazda, the wise Lord, is all wise and all seeing uh, and so forth uh, and all good absolutely good but is not all powerful mm -hmm. he in, he has or it I, that's, I misspoke because Ahura Mazda Mazda is feminine Ahura is masculine actually that is a dyadic entity that is masculine feminine it's an it really and uh, so it, uh, it says, I need one element in this world, in this battlefield against these forces of ignorance, stupidity, death, and disease. I need something. And that is my farvashis here to descend with rational thinking, good thoughts, good, good thoughts, good words, good deeds to descend into the battlefield and fight with those weapons. And that is humanity. Every individual human being is one of these heroes. Now, linking that to the Germanic world, that's what these Valkyrior are. They are the ones who have chosen, and that's what the Farvashi also means. The ones who chose, the ones who volunteered to come into the battlefield. So it's a connected uh, concept that again one of those Iranian Germanic connections, but there it makes sense. See, humanity is necessary to earthly happiness, perfection, and goodness. Humanity is the is the key to that. And if humans came to understand that about themselves, it would be a much different world. This is true. This is true. You know, that we're not bad. We're not, you know, so many people are trying to tell everybody they're bad. They're no good. They're evil, whatever. It still uh, goes on very much in our consciousness. But uh, that, that, that's not going to make anybody any better. It's like you have a kid. I don't. I don't have kids, so I uh, devoted myself to my work. But uh, uh, I... Uh, you know, I just you, 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 if you have a kid, like I was brought up uh, very well, you know, no, you know, always positive, right? Just you, know, you start to say bad things, uh, discouraging things to children and so forth. It hurts them, 
it, defor it deforms their their spirits. And so you've got to keep things be positive and, and a good image of what is who you are and what you can be. And even if it, uh, let's assume it's even a lie, you know, I mean, in the sense that it's not as true as we would like to believe, it's still a more magical. And that's where the word magic, I guess, is, is an Iranian word, the whole thing of magic and m making things happen, you know, and taking power over our lives. That's a technology that was... Um, was perfected by these people. And that's why, for example, you know, it's an Iranian thing to uh, celebrate individual birthdays. They had sort of invented that. Because why? Because you would celebrate the birth of a person going on uh, year after year as a celebration of that individuality, which is a radical concept. And that is precisely why the early Christians wrote a story about three Iranian priests coming to celebrate Jesus's birth because it was the Iranian thing to do. Right. And of course, these magi, these were the, the greatest authorities of religion in the world, the most prestigious kind of religious figures in the world. And so if they could write a story that says, hey, these, these Magoi think our guy is just okay. He's a great guy, you know. <laughs> then that gives us prestige by by their connection. So that's the sort of secret behind that story. Well hey and the uh, whole thing about the star, you know, and all that, that's all Iranian kind of ideas there. Hey hey Stephen, we got yeah. like two two we have two minutes left. Two I minutes wanna, I, I want to say I appreciate it so much. I've I've loved it and I'll definitely uh keep an eye out for your new books and get you on again. I've loved it so much and enjoy talking about this uh sure. subject matter a whole lot. Uh so I just want to thank you. Thank you for coming on the show and I've really enjoyed it. And what what do you have a website or any links you want to give out? No, just you can get my books on Amazon. I, I've devoted, I'm devoting uh, my uh, next few years to finishing some projects. I'll be turning 68 in uh, just a few days here. And, uh, you know, you can't just you drag it out forever, you know. So I, I've been trying to get important things that I want done before it's, uh, time runs out uh, to uh, to get that done. And so that's what I'm focusing on and uh, not so much and when book sales and that, you know, books, uh, being a bookseller like I used to be. Yes. Uh, so uh, everything is available on, on Amazon and uh, such. So that's where any Stephen Flowers, Edward Thorson books there, uh, they can find either name there. Uh, or if you look at my, my uh, Wikipedia page, uh, Stephen Flowers Wikipedia page. Whoever runs that, I don't run it. Of course, uh, uh, is keeps up with my publications very meticulously. I've noticed, you know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, somebody, uh, somebody else is a fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. I guess there's a couple of guys. I don't know them. I, I talked to one of them once, and I think he's a Swede. But uh, anyway, they uh, they think it's uh, they've done good. I, I went through it, and at one point I thought, well, there's something here. It's like, you know, they mention, oh, Edred's grandfather was in the Klan. Well, so what? Everybody's grandfather was in the Klan. You know, <laughs> you know, you're talking about the early part of the 20th century. You know, somehow I'm responsible, you know. So I pointed that out. I said, I can't, I can't be responsible for that. And uh, so, uh, you know, they took it out. You know, it was just like this, you know. Uh, and, and so I, I can't, uh, uh, there's not too much there that, that's incorrect. Some things, but not too many. Not, not like some people have terrible Wikipedia pages that are full of inaccuracies and incomplete, you know, nonsense. But, uh, I'm lucky to have it. I'm glad that's there and that's cool. Well, and I, and I, and for both of you, I want to say, um, blessed Val, Val Pergusnacht, um, uh -huh. I, I'm in upstate New York, and we have got a mighty wind blowing here tonight. So, uh -oh. <laughs> the, the, the rock and the, 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 yeah. the goat will be. 
serve tonight. Yeah, ma making up for, for for what both of you are missing. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> well, it's a rainy, it's a dark and stormy night here, but uh, but it's not it's not that cold. But. Right. I just been hoping my Skype doesn't go out because uh, literally the house has been shaking a couple times. <laughs> so yeah. Oh, Skype is ho hopeless here. I, mean, I have a satellite, so that's the only way I can get internet out in the woods, and that's not reliable. Yeah, if I've been there with that, for sure, with the satellite dish in the yard to get internet, mm -hmm. internet and all that stuff. But we appreciate it so much, Stephen. Okay. We'll be in touch well, with thank your future you. stuff for sure. Take care, and thank you. Thank you so much. You too. Okay. It was nice talking to you. Let's see you okay, good night. good night. Good night, everybody. Okay. Good night. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. That was a good one. Don Webb and then Stephen Flowers. Boom. That's right. All right, everybody. Have a good weekend. And Loki's got his own Disney show coming up, so check it out. Oh, there you go. Bye. <laughs> it actually looks really good. All right, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. All righty, JoJo, hopefully uh, I'm going to hang up, I guess, and hopefully everything's good to go. And uh, that was definitely a good one, for sure. Good night, everybody. Have a good weekend.